So friends, uh, <coughs> Dr. Richard Bajaj has uh, given us a historical viewpoint uh, with respect to uh, feminism today and uh, in, in the lecture today is very important because uh, the scene of patriarchy, the scene of struggles with, with, with patriarchy, both of men and women, is becoming more and more intense by the day in fact and therefore uh, we have uh, Professor uh, Richard Bajaj to tell us about the uh, points that she would like to make about uh, the feminism in the existing context. So without uh, any, any further explanation and comment, I request Professor Bajaj to uh, kindly give her view of the... Uh, it is indeed a pleasure to talk to fellow students and scholars about feminism or about Indian feminism as I thought I'll discuss today. In fact, the topic of my lecture is modern Indian feminist thought. And um, I would like to discuss this on Women's Day just to take stock of the situation as you can say and to understand where uh, women's movements are headed, uh, what we need to do uh, in, this, uh, in this new situation of the 21st century and uh, to also understand uh, the way that, uh, you know, the kind of long history of uh, Indian feminism in the 20th century. So uh, I thought that it's a good idea to also begin with a sort of references from the past in order to understand uh, where modern Indian feminism is headed today. So uh, in, in order to do that, I'd like you to look, you know, to look at or to consider, in fact, how women's issues were first raised uh, by the religious reformers of uh, the 19th century, such as Raja Ram Mohan Roy and Ishwar Chandra Vidya Sagar who actually sought to make space for women's rights within the Indian customs. So remember that these were reform movements and largely reform move, uh, religious reform movements in India uh, during the, you know, the reign of the British that these reformers were, you know, uh, fought tooth and nail just to be able to get some space for women to be able, able to exercise their limited rights. So for instance, just the abolition of sati, you know, just to stop this kind of self-immolation that took place if your husband died, then you had to, uh, you know, forcefully, uh, you know, take up self-immolation. So, you know, the abolition of Sati in 1829, I think, uh, was the beginning of this kind of a uh, reform uh, exercise or reform movement that took shape in the 19th century. Again, the Widows Remarriage Act that came up in 1856 or for that matter the age of consent for women in 1863. These were landmark decisions I think that in a way paved the way for further reforms and uh, opened Indian society to uh, consider women's issues as important. You know, so um, women till this point were seen as slaves and secondary. I mean, it's not, you see the moment when we, the moment we say reform, then we are looking at a situation which is about amending certain things, which doesn't really re refer to a kind of a revolution. It's not to say that uh, women were able to win every right in, in their favor but that limited sort of it's like pushing the envelope as much as you can and uh, this is what I think 19th century did for women to uh, push for their rights and limited rights but to be able for them to be able to consider themselves as dignified human beings so I think this became uh, the kind of foundation of all the movements that took shape in the 20th century Referring to the early phase of, say, uh, the early 20th century, I'd say that women activists and writers at the turn of the century began to intervene in the cultural sphere. You know, they began to also express themselves through literature. You know, take the case of, for instance, Pandita Ram Ramabai, or uh, you take the case of Rukaya Sakhawat Hussain. Uh, all these, uh, you know, women. Uh, writers they in a way spoke through their visual you know through through the pen they uh, envisioned a kind of equality and dignity for women uh, and you know uh, we've also discussed how shakavat uh, rukaya shakavat hussein actually wrote the sultana's dream which was about a kind of a women's utopia in a sense a female utopia where all women took up the roles of men and men took up the roles of women so what would happen to such a society in rukaya shakavat hussein's view it would would be for the better of society that women took up technology, science, governance, polity because they'd make they'd make able administrators and they'd make able scientists and uh, society would run uh, you know in a proper way. Of course, you know it's it's seen as it's very amusing and uh, is seen more as a utopia. But these were the kind of dreams that women had, you know, of living the life that men had. Of course, it would evoke envy. Of course, women were being constantly pushed in their own domestic spheres. So. 
uh, the kind of envisioning I think took place in the early phase of the 20th century when uh, women you know started dreaming about a world which could be equal and where women could lead a dignified life. I think the major uh, sort of uh, the watershed moment in women's you know history or women's movement was the national movement uh, because women were drawn into the pub political struggle uh, against the colonial rule in it. In fact, uh, Renuka Ray in her essay where she discusses uh, the background of the Hindu code bill, uh, you know, observed and I quote from uh, her essay, she says, the most momentous change in the position of women in India was due to the efforts of Mahatma Gandhi, who in launching his campaign of non-violent, non-cooperation in the struggle for Indian freedom, ignored both law and custom by specifically calling upon women to participate. They left the seclusion of their homes and courting imprisonment came forward to help in ever, every emergency that faced the country. No legislation could have been more sweeping or more effective than the Mahatma's call, which leveled the barriers of established customs almost overnight. Thus, the non-cooperation movement for national independence brought the emancipation of women in its wake. Thenceforth, women in ever larger numbers became increasingly active not only in the freedom struggle, but also in various fields of social service." Unquote. What do you think of this? Well, I think it's a very good point that you are making regarding social change occurring at the political level, at the social level, and women being an integral part of both I, when they come forward and uh, start uh, becoming aware and participants in the process, hmm. then nothing like it. You know, I'm also reminded of Simone de Boer's uh, The Second Sex, uh, wherein she mentions that uh, women kept, uh, you know, fighting for their suffrage in the first decade of the 20th century. And uh, each time they pushed for it, each time protests came up, they were, uh, you know, refused the right to vote, right? But uh, it was during the First World War when women came out and uh, came out of their homes and started serving uh, these uh, soldiers, you know, started offering social service in society. It is then where their efforts and their service became visible to the world and to the countries and post that she says women received suffrage. So I'd like you to comment on how you think that um, women's protests registered say, uh, as Simone de Bois says, that registered during the First World War in England and in Europe when they were involved in uh, caring for the, uh, you know, the, the bruised and the injured soldiers, wounded in hospitals and so offering social service. So they came out in the public sphere and started offering care you know, a social uh, service. This was a uh, social responsibility that somebody had to fulfill and women came f forward and they used the occasion for becoming s more self-aware also in the meantime. Right. They started writing, they started participating in protests, hmm. they started in running workshops hmm. and uh, Bernard Shaw of course uh, talks even before the First World War. But then uh, First World War was the occasion when society needed women's participation to uphold itself. Right. In Europe. And I think a uh, similar thing, uh, similar is the case in India during the national movement mm -hmm. that women are brought out into the public sphere by the call that Mahatma Gandhi gives and in and they participate in social service. Again, as you say, they become self-aware mm -hmm. of their roles and their social responsibility mm -hmm. as, uh, as as upholders of these values. So emancipation of women Women, in that sense, the women's movement uh, received a boost because of, in the wake of the national movement and uh, that it, they became visibly uh, active in the public sphere. Uh, you know, and uh, the, during this period in India, there were formation of various women's organizations and women's, women participated in these national uh, organizations and national movement. These, uh, you know, women's organization, in fact, received a kind of a boost or a fill-up because of the other movements that were simultaneously taking place. So this in fact helped strengthen uh, women's position as stakeholders in public life. It, I mean take the case of the various organizations that were floating in the first part of the century. For instance there was women, there was All India Muslim Ladies Conference 
Anjuman, which was there in 1914, took shape, you know, and re, uh, reshaped itself later. Uh, Women's Indian, uh, Women's India Association, WIA, which was in 1917, uh, founded in 1917. Then National Council of Women in India, founded in 1923. Then, of course, the biggest, the All India Women's Conference, uh, AIWC, which was in 1927, founded. And uh, it paved these organizations, in a way, paved the way for a new feminist thought. Yes, yes. <clears throat> and I can in fact connect uh, all this with uh, the literature that was being written at that time. Uh, Tagore's, you know, Home and the World hmm. is, is about the, the, the Bengal division and the role of the women. Right. The protagonist, woman protagonist in, in, in that novel is uh, actually uh, pre prevailed upon by, by an admirer, by, by a kind of worshipper mm -hmm. uh, f uh, to, you know, ask that woman to come forward and, right. and to join the movement socially. Right. So in a way, in, uh, I'm glad that you mentioned Home and the World here because, uh, you see, if you, uh, if you remember the text, then the woman is also, the image of the woman is also going through a kind of a, an overhaul in that sense because she is also being reworked and uh, given a kind of a new framework. So the, uh, the image of womanhood also is changing where the woman is, um, you know, the deification of woman is happening at the time where she is viewed as a deity and also representing motherland. So uh, woman as mother and woman as motherland, uh, they become synonyms in that sense, which, um, to, which is at one level problematic because you don't know how much it's helping women's movements, for instance, because then women are also stuck in that image of womanhood, right? That there need to be these idolized sort of women uh, who are who are caretakers, who who are sacrificing themselves, and both uh, Nikhil and Chandip then are you know enamored of this woman, right? That is the woman as country uh, and uh, woman as mother. But then you're also uh, stereotyping that woman. So I think that one, it received a change that this image of womanhood changed during the national movement where woman was seen as a caregiver and um, as as a nurturer but also as mother and as country and motherland so all these were new uh, phrases that were attached to women uh, because you see till this point you were looking at a woman as an enslaved subject right she was servile but now you have elevated her to a deity a level of the deity so there is this in this deification of uh, the woman subject there has obviously you again not given her the human right right she's no more the human so you have uh, from the servile to the divine sort of a status but uh, the idea is that there was a kind of a refashioning of the image of womanhood uh, during this period so uh, and these conferences I think uh, in a way gave back to women the sense of agency that they lacked you know so uh, the issues that these conferences discussed for instance would include uh, women's participation in public life uh, again, especially against the anti-british struggle uh, the education of women building strong familial ties you know family that she's the upholder of family values uh, non-western right and um, equal rights for women so these are the questions that these movements and these organizations took up and there were new magazines there were women oriented magazines that were uh, uh, being brought out uh, and uh, protests happening, lectures that took place around this period. I think the seminal figure in this particular period is Saroshni Naidu, mm -hmm. you know, because she emerged as a kind of a national icon also of womanhood. Uh, and uh, she, you know, if you think of it, she's around uh, 1949. She dies in 1949. So the first half of the century is her area of work right uh, she became um, you know she she could be viewed as an uh, a seminal early feminist in the indian context who uh, voiced women's concerns in lectures and conferences that she went to you know she was a she was a poet but and right she wrote poetry but she was also deeply involved in politics and she would visit these uh, you know her main work was to visit uh, schools and uh, institutions and talk to the young generation so uh, i think she was uh, you know in one in one of her presidential address in ilabad that she gave she said if i had if i could have one wish then i would really ha want to mold young minds you know so that's what she says in that address that that you are required to participate in the nationalist movement. So I think uh, she participated in protest actions. She was also elected president of the Indian National Congress in 1925. And she took part in the Salt Satyagraha, one of the few people who, you know, among these leaders that we know who took part in the Salt Satyagraha in 1930. She was imprisoned thrice in 1930, 32 and 42. And uh, she was a firebrand in many ways. And as early as in 1917, she demanded for a full franchise for women. 
so what i'm trying to say by talking about these women is to one um, understand that we have a history of women's movements i mean uh, how many of us really know that uh, sarojini naidu was the indian national uh, you know she was the president of the indian national congress in 1925 so i think um, uh, in as uh, as somebody who is Uh, constantly uh, working in in this field i think it is our responsibility to bring back figures women participation and women's uh, contribution in the past century in order to be able to build a sort of a lineage and history in the 21st century because we cannot speak of a 21st century uh, fem modern indian feminism without referring to the struggles of women and the contributions of women in the 20th century uh, because if we do that then we'd really be hacking our feet because you, we are uh, we are hacking our history in that sense so uh, in order to be able to find a sort of a, a, a thread a kind of a joining thread it is important to see the way this movement has come to its present form as we understand today indian feminism to be and to also note and to reaffirm the contribution of women, uh, women during the 20th century whether it was in the field of nationalist struggle again there were um, there are i mean uh, there's paucity of time but if you look at so many different movements simultaneous movement the chipko movement for instance where women went and just hugged trees you know so uh, th- there is a need to uh, build a kind of a history where women's contributions can be registered and uh, for feminism to take forward uh, the work that has already the ground work that has already been done what do you think in the context you know of uh, <coughs> uh, women women's em- empowerment and envisioning of women uh, as you know participants in social change uh, one of the very good examples is from that hindi poem written by subhadra kumari chauhan hmm. khub ladi mardani wo to jhansi wali rani thi yes, so there sure. is a woman Yes. and there is a tradition tradition bound woman of the upper classes hmm. but she rides a horse and fights battles you know right. and 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 sword in hand right and and she she might finally die but then she has died for a cause right so this kind of a writing emerging in the 1920s and 30s when subhadra kumar chauhan was active they, they showed that there was a new age coming up and that in that age the central figure along with men would be women yes but and you know what these women were also uh, what as you mentioned subhadra kumar chauhan i think it's also to bring back uh you know the kind of uh, a- icons that you knew female icons that you need so when she talks about uh, jhansi ki rani then she is also referring to female icons within the movement who have participated and have won wars or have le- le- you know led wars in the struggle so in a way today for us therefore when i say we need to go back to people like subhadra kumari chauhan or sarojini naidu then we need to trace them as icons who can uh, help in uh, help fortify sort of this nationalist movement. movement or the uh, i mean the feminist movement in india uh, as it takes shape in the post independence period um, because what really happens and i noted this kind of a pattern that uh, as you know the more you get far from that period and as you come to the close of the uh, 20th century and enter the 21st century phase you seem to see this movement in the present you know it's become more spatial and has left and has uh, sort of lost its a uh, connection with the past because there are so many because there are multiple uh, kind of movements and multiple uh, women's movements in india whether you look at it from the point of view of caste or ethnicity or religion or tribe then what's happening is that you are caught in this feminist mold which exists today uh, and seems independent of its past but mm, i realize that if we do that then it's a kind of a um, you know it's a quagmire in many ways because then you're going to be sucked uh, in the logic in the internal logic that each movement presents unless uh, we find some joining threads uh, that can take us forward towards a kind of a building i think uh, a kind of a new uh, feminist thought an existing thing also has a potentiality so mm-hmm. so the existing thing is as, as you say internally bound with the logic but that logic also contains something that will take take it forward hmm. so those threads have to be uh, understood right. they, they, they have to be realized and they have to be used finally yes. to, right. to come forward so yeah and so i think uh, uh, going to uh, entering now the post independence period and women's movement within it one finds that in the free country the constitution assured women equal rights in terms of their franchise 
and uh, the laws were clearly uh, you know on the side uh, you know uh, gave equality to both sexes and did away with any discrimination based on sex uh, in that matter that is the free country and the uh, constitution uh, uh, you know assured us equal rights uh, but what you found uh, the paradox was that you found that in the social sphere women still had to deal with problems of for instance dowry malnutrition sexual violence uh, inadequ inadequate sort of maternity care forced uh, you know production of babies child marriages even though it was prohibited by law so what explains this paradox the position of indian women uh, appeared to be a paradox in this uh, situation what how do you answer this no reality is always uh, paradoxical mm -hmm. and uh, certain things you know go forward and they they are pulled back by other forces so this is the kind of phase of struggle that that is to continue and that that is to be accepted as real right but do you think that poverty ignorance the low literacy rate at the time these added to the prejudice against women definitely mm -hmm. definitely they, they are reflected in the uh, prejudices that uh, that society is kept backwards right and uh, women uh, have to bear the brunt so even if uh, the constitution offered us a kind of free equal franchise and equality of the sexes because the other issues such as poverty were not uh, addressed so they indirectly reflected and affected women's position in society and um, further complicated it definitely and uh, the, the political process is that way uh, you know uh, dialectical now uh, it, it take goes forward it comes back and what is pulled back in this case tragically as, as you point out uh, is is the economic suppression being associated with women's uh, you know responsibilities so they have to be pulled back all the time by right. certain forces of course you know if there's no if there's not enough money in the house then the woman is pulled back from mm. education if she's mm. if there's not money in the house then the mother has to probably go out and work and she's supposed to take care of siblings mm. right mm. so you uh, poverty and uh, uh, and low literacy rate maybe lack of education has uh, you know added to the obstacles and even though constitutionally women have been guaranteed this kind of equal rights uh, socially they have had to deal with these kind of issues and prejudices in society right and uh, of course the uh, so how do you explain so at one level legally uh, you know you have the rights but then uh, sexual violence continues uh, marital rape continues so how do you explain that what is the gap between the um, legal and uh, you know the the constitutional uh, behavior and what is the code of conduct that is exercised for instance in the house in the domestic sphere that's a difficult question because legally uh, women have been given uh, sanctioned equality uh, but then you know the, the woman has to persist with uh, you know uh, the situation in society and she has to be a part of the home and she is called the homemaker uh, uh, euphemistically but actually she she is kept as a slave still and she is a slave of uh, uh, slave uh, this uh, uh, dowry and uh, lack of education so all these things are there so uh, finally i would say that uh, these questions that you are raising have to be ad uh, addressed you know much more seriously than before and uh, women's uh, kind of uh, movement that is to to go, go forward uh, has to take note of 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 these difficulties and challenges so uh, friends uh, with this discussion uh, where uh, uh, dr uh, richa bajaj has talked about the history in the 19th century of the women's movement and uh, taking its uh, uh, becoming flowering and you know uh, in the, in the 20th century this is to be taken further in the present context where uh, it it uh, faces some kind of a roadblock and that uh, the the intellectuals the the, the uh, people, citizens who are aware they have to take note of it and suggest ways to uh, you know strengthen the, the the cause of feminism thank you